What are some good beginner Imbunas? How important is aquarium depth? And will Imbunas ever stop breeding? I'm gonna answer all three of those questions and share with you an interesting comment of the week in this episode of Tank Talk. Hey folks, it's John with Cage Tropical. Super excited to be back with you today doing another episode of Tank Talk I missed. Last week I was a bit under the weather, sorry about that, but we are back now and ready to have a whole lot of fun. So if you want to see your questions answered in this type of Q&A format, send your questions in through the comment section down below. If you have a video that you want to attach to that, you can email me at kgqna at gmail.com and I can include your video on the Q&A. So anyway, let's get right to it. Let's get to the first question. Okay, first question comes from the Shabster69. Hi John, I'm currently in the process of setting up my first African cichlid tank after having kept community tropical fish for several years now. I decided to go down the African cichlid route due to a combination of being inspired by your videos over the years and also because I find them fascinating, beautiful, and interactive species. My question for a possible future Tank Talk video or even another video such as 10 Things is, please could you recommend a selection of Mbuna fish that are suitable for a beginner African cichlid keeper? Ideally ones that are slightly less aggressive, although I appreciate aggression is a given to a degree, especially with Mbunas. Keep up the good work with the relaunch of the channel. Thanks, all the best. Mark from Manchester, UK. All right, so the first thing to talk about here is that I do believe that Mbunas are a good way to get started in African cichlids. Yes, they are aggressive, but pretty much any fish that's gonna be under the category of African cichlid is gonna be pretty aggressive, but Mbunas are a great way to start because you don't need a massive tank and they're beautiful, they're a lot of fun, and the males and females are both usually equally as attractive, whereas with a lot of the peacocks and haps, that's not the case. So uh, I'm a big fan of starting people out with Mbunas. Now, if we're going to talk about which Mbunas would be the best as far as being the least aggressive, this is where things are gonna get a little bit tricky because so much of this is based on experience. My experience with them might be different from others. So uh, if you have a suggestion for Mark from the UK, put them down in the comment section below of what you would suggest. Maybe we disagree on which ones are on the less aggressive side. But anyway, in my experience, okay, this is my experience. You asked me, Libidochromis, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Cynotilapia, that's how I say it, Cynotilapia, C-Y-N-O-T-I-L-A-P-I-A, -I, -I, I believe, ding, 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 uh, and Labiatrophius. Those are going to be the ones, again, I don't know if I'm saying any one of those three right, but Labiatrophius, Libidochromis, and Cynotilapia, uh, those are going to be, if you get any Mbunas that their scientific name starts with one of those three, you're going to be good. In my experience, those are the ones that are going to be the least aggressive. Still going to be aggressive. You're still going to have to take measures to control that, but they're going to be the ones that, in my experience, I've had the least amount of problems with. They seem to be pretty peaceful. Now, I my brain is a terrible place. I've got so many things running through my mind, in, in case you're wondering why I keep looking over here. Yes, I did jot down some notes because I wanted to make sure that I, I said this correctly and I don't want to deliver bad information. But then again, some of you might listen to this and still think it's bad information because we disagree on our opinions and our experiences, but that's okay. I do want to refer to this though, just to make sure I don't miss anything. Now, the other three that I'm going to tell you to kind of stay away from. These are not bad by any stretch, but they're the ones that, in my experience, have been the most aggressive of the Mbunas are going to be your Metroclemas, which are going to be your Zebras and things like that, which I love, those fish, uh, the Pseudotrophius and Melanochromus. Okay, I can stop looking over there now. Those three, 
you're gonna find things like your zebras, like your demasoni, things like that are gonna be listed under those categories, not categories, but those scientific names. If you stay away from those, you should be good. Now again, there's no guarantees for any of this. Imbunas are naturally aggressive. They're naturally territorial. You just have to deal with that. But again, Labidochromis, Cyanotilapia, and Labiotrophius, if you stay with those three, you're probably pretty likely to get fish that are gonna be the, the least amount aggressive possible. But of course, they're still gonna be aggressive. Next question comes from my friend Rack over at The River Life. And this is an interesting one. It almost could have been comment of the week. I love this guy. His words that he uses are just so way over my head. He says, I have a comment and a question. Like a phoenix from the ashes, way to dust off a mighty winged concept. Looking forward to this incarnation of your accumulated experience generating another original content delivery platform. Wow, I feel smarter having just read that. Good job, Rack. Considering the bookshelf style of aquariums that are long and shallow, how important is water depth in an aquarium? Now, what Rack is talking about here is that it is becoming very popular to have aquariums like that. Uh, how do dentists do it? Like that, smaller, narrower tanks that can go on things like bookcases or on desks or whatever. The nano tanks, the smaller nano tanks are becoming wildly popular. I think we've got seven of them now. Um, and they're, they're all over the place, all different styles, different designs, things like that. They're becoming very, very popular. They're taking over the hobby, which is cool. But uh, so the question is how important is aquarium depth? Um, I think it's pretty much gonna be dependent on the fish that you're keeping. And I think that some common sense has to be used uh, when, when determining whether a fish is gonna be okay in a narrow aquarium like that. Uh, you have to think about things like how big is the fish gonna get? And if you have a four foot long tank and you, you have a fish that gets 12 inches, you're gonna be like, well, that's okay because you know it, it's four feet long. They've got an extra three feet, that's no big deal. But how deep is that aquarium? Now, this is something that I don't know that I've ever really talked about, but somebody that's a new fish keeper might appreciate this tidbit of information here. When we're talking about depth, we're talking about from the front glass face to the back. We're not talking about the height of it. That would be the height. So when you look at an aquarium's measurements, 48 by 12 by 18, that's gonna be talking about 48 inches long, 12 inches deep front to back and 18 inches in height. So if you have a long tank, but it's only 12 inches deep and you have a fish that's gonna to get to 12 inches, think about that. It's gonna be hard to turn around. Uh, but of course, I don't think Rack is talking about big fish here that are gonna get 12 inches because he's talking about small bookshelf type aquariums. If you're dealing with your nano type fish like we have in here, the emperor tetras, if you have things like betas, guppies, smaller tetras like neon and cardinal tetras, things like that, you're gonna be fine in pretty much anything. I mean, any of these tanks are gonna be suitable for fish like that. Um, but if you're gonna start getting into cichlids and, and things like that, that are gonna get much larger, even uh, the, the, the non-aggressive, I don't know, I might've just misspoke there, but <laughs> fish like angels, and things like that that are still cichlids, but they're, you know, they're not the mean type of cichlids unless they're breeding. Um, obviously, that's a fish that's gonna get much larger and you're probably not gonna have them in a nano tank anyway. So anyway, I'm, I'm completely rambling. I missed last week, I got a lot of making up to do, but uh, I feel like it should be a common sense thing as far as what fish you would put into one of those bookshelf type, type bookshelf type aquariums, uh, you're gonna be looking for the smaller nano type fish anyway. So I don't think it's gonna be much of an issue for many people. Anybody that has a tank like that, that puts a, a common Pleco and an Oscar in it, that's not gonna be somebody that's gonna be in this hobby for very long. Anybody that's taking this seriously is gonna decorate an aquarium like that with small nano, uh, nano fish. Did I just call fish decorations? How dare I do that? But you know what I'm saying. Uh, smaller fish, 
you shouldn't have any problems at all. And that's pretty much with those kind of tanks, that's what everybody's going for anyway. All right, and now for my favorite segment of the week, comment of the week. This is where I find a comment. It could be in my held for review or spam folder. It could be public, it could be whatever. This could be something funny, something controversial, something silly, something mean, who knows. Uh, today's is quite interesting. And it's a uh, entire paragraph, one sentence, no punctuation, no periods, no nothing, no capitalization and horrible grammar and spelling, but I'm gonna try to get through this and, uh, and, and read it the way that it's read. Let's have some fun. Must use conditioner is bullshit. I've keep fish for 10 years. I have big display fish, never have used conditioner. You want to use chems on your fish, you do that. People that know what they're doing use rift salt and some rock salt is all you need. Never had a fish die of ick or had my fish die from having chloride in my water. <laughs> so you can make new hobbyists freak out with your know all and know nothing bullshit, dude. You need to realize that just because you do something your way, it's not the only way to have nice, healthy fish and a good aquarium. Not only do you sound like a dick, you get your wife in your videos to sound and look as crazy as you. <laughs> and bleach in the tank, to clean it sounds like you were the person that tried that. Ha 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 ga. Also, I have never used test strips. Wife has when she wanted to see if she was pregnant, but that test strip is just a waste of money. Any person can see good water and don't need to waste money on strips if they want to test water. There's a cheaper way than that. Get a digital tester, 50 bucks, and it will last forever. That way it's not a repeated cost. Okay, so the reason why I am bringing this comment to light, I've chosen this one as comment of the week, is because this is a person that trolls my channel and, and other channels, I'm assuming, because he goes on my videos and comments about other video, other channels. And I have a problem with that. If you want to come onto my channel and pick on me, you do that all you want. You want to talk to me about some of the most bare bone basic rules of fish keeping and say that I'm wrong about those, that's fine. You're, you're really making yourself look silly, not me. But when you start talking about other channels, that's when I have a problem with it. Of course, I'm not going to highlight those comments in comment of the week because why? Why would I want to do that? Those usually get sent to my spam or held for review file uh, because I have foul language. I, I don't allow foul language in my comment section, at least the really bad ones. And that guy doesn't know how to put up a comment that doesn't have a bunch of four letter words in it because he must be about 12 years old. So I, his comments always go to my one of the folders. I don't know. It's an automatic thing. YouTube does it. Uh, and I thank YouTube for that because, you know, but uh, look, if you're going to troll channels, that's fine. I mean, it's part of the deal. It doesn't hurt my feelings, uh, especially when what you're talking about is kind of really silly, like you've done here. But if you're gonna talk about other channels, that's kind of crossing the line. Talk about me all you want, but talk about other channels, you and I are gonna have a problem. So anyway, this is on here because if you are a YouTuber, you need to know this is coming. I don't care if you have eight subscribers like that guy, uh, or if you have, 12,000 subscribers, whether you've seen it yet or not, it's coming. I promise you it will. And you have to be able to do what I've done here. And just kind of laugh it off. It's silly. It's, it's craziness. You have to be able to laugh it off and have some fun with it. And if you're somebody like me that has a potty mouth, but you try to keep that away from your videos, just look in your settings and all of that. You can set it up to where certain words will make it go automatic to held for review so the public doesn't see just nonsense like this. All right, so the last question for today comes in from Robert P. And he says, hey, John, love the format. Question for you is my Mbuna's tank, 125 gallon, has been breeding like crazy. Will they stop when the tank is overcrowded? So the answer to your question, Robert P., unfortunately, is no. These fish do not care how many fish are in the tank with them. They don't care how crowded it is. 
They want to get their work done and there's nothing that you're going to be able to do that can stop them. About the only thing you can do is remove the females, taking away the potential for breeding. Population means nothing to them. So understand that any Imbuna keeper, since we had a beginner Imbuna question as the first question, uh, let this be a lesson to you too. You put males and females together, there will be breeding. It will happen and you will not be able to stop it no matter how many fish you have in the tank. They're gonna clear out an area. The male is gonna aggressively defend that area, scaring everybody else away and they're gonna do their thing and you're not gonna be able to stop them. Now, usually in a heavily crowded tank like that, the fry are pretty much gonna get taken care of on their own, meaning they're not gonna make it very long before they get eaten by the other fish in the tank, even the parents in some cases. So usually the population will be controlled that way, but apparently you've got a lot of really nice fish in your tank that don't want to eat their young and they just keep reproducing and, and keep doing their thing. You're not gonna be able to stop that, Robert, unfortunately. You're gonna to have to either take the females out or, well, what else is there? I mean, that's pretty much all you can do. There is no birth control drops that you can put in the water that's gonna make them stop doing this. So yeah, it's one of those things that you have to deal with. Uh, you keep in bonus, you have males and females together, they're gonna breed and you can't stop them. So either be prepared to take care of the fry, let the let nature take its course in your tank, or get rid of the females. I mean, there's really nothing else to say. So there you go, this episode was a lot of fun. All these episodes are a lot of fun. I like this kind of format, it's relaxed, it's easy going, I enjoy it. If you wanna see your questions answered in a future episode like this, put them down in the comment section below. Don't put those four letter words in it because it'll get held for review, <laughs> but put them in the comment section down below. And if you have a video or photos or something like that that you want to attach to it, kgqna at gmail.com is where you're going to want to send those. And you never know, I might pick your question and I might answer it as good as I can. So there you go. Thank you so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next week.